So, I was a weird little kid. It wasn't that I didn't like to play sports or ride my bike, but what I really loved playing with was tape recorders. This was my grandfather's tape recorder. Whenever I went over to his house as a little kid, I would grab this tape recorder and go into the back room, and I would record funny voices, fake commercials, whatever, for hours. He would come back into the room and say, Scotty, why don't you go play in the treehouse I built you outside? And I'd say, well, could I take the tape recorder up there? There are over 50,000 voice actors in the United States today. And I'm one of them. We come into your homes and cars and computers. Uh, we're your favorite cartoon characters. We're the announcers on commercials. Uh, we're the voices on the games that you guys love to play. But we are invisible. We're just normal, unrecognizable people until we stand in front of a microphone and say, this summer from Marvel, or it's the Toyota Camry celebration. This week at Ralph's, Red Delicious Apple, 69 cents. How do you kill what's already dead? You're in the Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer, CNN Next, or Shark Tank, Sunday on ABC. So these are a few of the things I've been paid to say. Thank you very much. And, and here's a few more. What if there was a place beyond your imagination? And to get there, all you have to do is believe. Something magical is happening in theaters across the nation. On May 1st. Ultron's calling us out. From Academy Award winning director Mel Gibson. Hacksaw Ridge is a cinematic masterpiece. We're scared and we all are. It's a brilliant blend of heart. We can't run away. And sheer terror. 20th Century Women is now a Golden Globe nominee for Best Picture and Best Actress Annette Bening. A staggering visual spectacle. With the immersive force of an enduring screen classic, Disney Nature proudly invites you to its most ambitious film yet. Be there. Give me a little juice, Friday. For the cinematic event of a lifetime. The Polar Express. Interstellar. Avengers. Age of Ultron. Captain America. Civil War. Won't you be my neighbor? 20th Century Women. Dunkirk. Born in China. Hacksaw Ridge. It. Avengers Infinity War. Rated PG-13. Everywhere Friday. All right. Well, that's what I do for a living. <clears throat> so how does this happen? A kid with his grandpa's tape recorder ends up doing over 100,000 voiceover sessions. So today is my story of my leaps of faith. And I hope the story of my journey will help you on yours. So uh, back to the little kid weirdness. Disneyland. I grew up in Orange County and we loved to go to Disneyland. And I loved the rides and I loved the shows. But when the announcer's voice came up over the speakers and said, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I would stop in my tracks. As a little kid, I didn't care what he had to say. I wanted to know, how was he saying it? That booming voice, that beautiful tone. So as a little kid at Disneyland, I started imitating him in the park. And my parents thought it was so cute. But little did they know that in the early 1990s, I would replace that guy and become the voice of Disneyland. So I also loved listening to television announcers, movie trailer announcers. Uh, I loved disc jockeys. I loved the voices of the disc jockeys more than the music that they played. I imitated all of those. Now, I also loved listening to my dad on the radio. My dad was a Los Angeles City firefighter, and he eventually became a chief. But during some of my formative years, he was really, he was like the spokesman for the fire department. So it wasn't uncommon for me to hear my dad talk about uh, fires or earthquakes on the radio. And my dad actually took me to some of the Los Angeles radio stations and showed me around and introduced me to people. And that made a huge impression. So I wanted to get into radio. 
And years later, my dad would call and say, hey, Scott, I heard about a job selling radio advertising time. And no, nobody was going to hire me to be a disc jockey, but I figured it was a great start into an industry that I loved. And so I went down and I interviewed and they said, um, they said, uh, why should we hire you? You have no experience. And I said, if you hire me, I promise I will be the best radio salesperson you've ever hired. My dad taught me to say that in every interview. <laughs> He said, look them in the eye, tell them you'll be the best, and then be the best. So they couldn't turn that down. They hired me. And as it turned out, um, I became the top salesman at the radio station. But every night when I was done with my sales work, I would sneak back into the studio side of the radio station. And I would go into the production room, and I would put on the headphones, and I would start reading. Anything, just like when I was a kid. I was practicing for a job I didn't know how to get. I was, didn't know what I was doing, but at least I was doing something. So one day, a disc jockey walked into the, to the studio where I was recording. And he had a beautiful voice, and he'd been on the air for years. And he said, Scott, I've heard some of the stuff you're doing in this room. I'd love to save you a lot of time and heartache you do not have the talent or the skills to be on this side of the radio station. You should just go back to the sales side. And man, I felt like I got punched in the stomach. This was a professional telling me that I couldn't do my childhood dream. And so it really was a moment of truth. I had to decide whether I was gonna walk out the studio door, turn off the lights and never come back, or go put the headphones back on and keep reading. And something inside said, keep reading. So I remember walking back, putting on the headphones and looking through the studio glass and he was just shaking his head in bewilderment. But it wasn't long after that, that the production director at the radio station said, hey, I need a, somebody to be man number one in this bridal shop commercial I'm doing. I said, I'll do it. And so I went in there and I said, <clears throat> my one line, wow, you look great. And uh, he said, man, that was perfect, thanks. And so now, my first commercial. It was being broadcast throughout Southern California. And then he said, well, you did a good job on that. Would you do a line for me here? And then, hey, maybe a few more lines here. And then um, some of my own clients started asking me if I would do their commercials. One of them was Disneyland. And they wanted me to do their Christmas commercial. Um, it went, um, it's a very merry Christmas parade at Disneyland. And that was big time. It was like, wow, you know, from the time I loved Disney as a kid and now I'm doing this commercial. And so um, one day I was driving back to the radio station and I was listening to talk radio and I heard this man by the name of Dawes Butler being interviewed. Now, Dawes was the voice of hundreds of characters that I'd grown up with on TV. Yogi Bear, Elroy Jetson, Captain Crunch, just many, many characters. And I was fascinated by this interview because I'd never heard an interview with a voice actor before. And during this interview, he said, I like to work with new young talent. And I said, that's me. I'm new young talent. I got to find this guy. I got to meet this guy. So I called Hanna-Barbera. And this nice lady named Andrea answered the phone and... Uh, I said, I'd really like to get Dawes Butler's phone number. And she said, well, we just don't give out our talent's phone numbers. Well, I explained that I had heard him on the radio say that he worked with new young talent, and I was new young talent. She said, hang on. She came back. She gave me his number. And so, oh, incidentally, years later, Andrea would cast me to be the voice of Aquaman in the Justice League program. I am the born ruler of Atlantis. I am Aquaman. <laughs> so now I have the phone number of one of the greatest voice actors of all time. I rehearse what I'm going to say to him, start to dial, hang up, rehearse again, hang up. Finally, I get the courage to let it ring. This little voice answers the phone and says, hello? I said, hello, Mr. Butler. My name is Scott Rommel. I heard you on the radio the other day. I heard you say that you like to work with new young talent. I'm new young talent. I'd really love to meet you. And he said, 
send me a tape. I said, I don't have a tape. He said, why don't you make a tape? And I said, would you help me make a tape? And he paused. He said, come to my house on Thursday. And so he gave me the address, Beverly Hills, so cool, right? So on Thursday, I went up there, I met him. He brought me into the studio, and then he started handing me scripts to read. Some were like normal, some were outrageous, some were silly, some were sad and dramatic. And I realize now he was really kind of assessing my range. We did this for like an hour, and then he said, Scott, God gave you a Stradivarius, but somebody needs to teach you how to play it. How would you feel about studying privately with me? I said, Dawes, I would love to study privately with you. I just don't know if I can afford it. How much is it? He said, it's $10. I said, $10? He said, is that too much? I said, no, $10 is great because at that time, the average rate was like $50 an hour for voiceover coaching. So he said, well, I feel like you should pay something for it so it's worth something to you. I said, $10 is perfect. So now, every week I'm driving up to Beverly Hills and studying with Dawes. I didn't realize it at the time, but really studying with Dawes was like going to Yale for voiceover. It really was. Uh, there were so many now famous folks studying with Dawes at that time. Uh, during the time I was studying with Dawes, Nancy Cartwright was studying which uh, she's the voice of Bart Simpson and so many others. Anyway, Dawes didn't teach me how to do funny voices. Dawes taught me about acting. He taught me about how to, de to develop a character. He taught me about subtext, how to touch one word with the weight of the dust on a moth's wings, just enough to make all the difference. He taught me about microphone technique. He taught me about the business of show how to deal with agents and directors and, and management. And then, yes, he helped me make a tape. And then he said, Scott, you really need an agent if you're going to be successful in Hollywood. We need to send this tape out. So at that time, there was only 15 agents in Hollywood that handled voiceover. And so we sent them to all 15. And one by one, I called them. And one by one, they all said no. Some were really nice. You have a good voice. Some were short. We're not taking submissions right now. And some were really harsh. This one guy was especially harsh. He said, don't waste my time. I won't even listen to your tape unless you're a known voice actor in Hollywood for 10 years and making a good six-figure income. He said, I'm going to throw your tape away unless you want to come by and pick it up. He was number 14. They had all said no. There was one agency left my last hope. So I had to call them and I picked up the phone and to my surprise, the agent was very enthusiastic. Scott, we listened to your tape. We love it. You have a great sound. You're going to make a lot of money. You've got a ton of potential, but we just signed somebody in your same voice category. So we can't sign somebody like you for another six months. So please check back with us. Six months was like an eternity. I, I want to do voiceover now. So I said to her, what was the name of the person that you just signed? She told me, and I said, does he make a good amount of money? She said, yeah, he does. I said, which agency did he come from? She told me it was the harsh guy that I had just talked to earlier. So I said, thank you very much, and I picked the phone back up, and I called that guy back, and he was irritated. He said, I told you I'm not interested. I said, hang on a second. I just talked to another agent. She said, I have a ton of potential. She said, I have a good sound. I'm going to make a lot of money. And I sound just like the guy that you just lost. And he said, I'll see you tomorrow at noon. <laughs> and so I went up there and he signed me. And I now had a Hollywood agent. And so I quit my job in radio. I started driving to Hollywood every day for auditions. I used to pay, uh, pray for one audition every day and then I used to pray for a one job a day and you know it, it, it was a progression on the way into Hollywood every day you might find this interesting I used to read every billboard aloud as my warm-up into Hollywood <clears throat> so I loved it when they changed billboards anyway um, so my career was starting to grow and 
Oh, yes. My big break. I was auditioning like crazy and was doing some local and regional commercials, but my big break was my first national television campaign. And uh, I went to the studio and I was only there for 15 minutes. I walked to the mic and I said, having trouble with your jeans? Try Lee, the brand that fits. <laughs> it was really a short session, but they put that line on every Lee Jeans commercial for the next three years. And finally, I had a steady paycheck. So my career continued to grow. And before long, I had a lot of presence on TV and radio. I was, uh, you know, like uh, on the Super Bowl. That was a big deal. I heard my voice on a commercial uh, on the Super Bowl. And so um, during that time where my career was really growing, my friend Dawes passed away. And that was really hard for me. He was such a great friend and mentor and coach, and I really loved him. And um, I felt sort of alone in the business for the first time. But then I needed another coach, and I found this person named Maurice. They called Maurice the voice psychologist. She was known for people, uh, helping people find their money voice, the sound that would become their brand. And she, by the way, was not $10 a session. Uh, she was significantly more, but she was great. And she was the one that really encouraged me to follow my dream of voice acting for movie trailers. And I said to her, Maurice, there's only like five guys that do this movie trailer work. And she said, yes, but opportunity will come. So we worked hard, we developed a style and a sound, and then we made a tape to show off my movie trailer skills. My agents loved that tape. They said, Scott, you sound great. If an opportunity comes, you'll be ready. And two years later, that opportunity came. She called me and said, uh, the largest trailer production house in Hollywood is hearing new voices tomorrow and I have a slot for you. And so I was so nervous, I was excited because this just never happened. This opportunity never came up. So I went over to Maurice's and we studied and worked hard and then she said, Scott, you're ready, you've got this. So I went the next day grabbed my script, and as soon as I looked at the script, I felt great. It was sort of right in my wheelhouse. I walked into the studio, and I'll never forget it. There was three guys behind the glass. I stood up to the microphone. They said, are you ready? I said, yes. They said, this is Scott Rummel. Take one. And I said, she is the mystery that haunts his heart. Annette Benning, Robert Downey Jr. in dreams. Well, I looked up, and they were all like doing this and looking puzzled at each other. And I didn't know if I was terrible or if I'd broken some unknown rule of movie voiceover. So I stood up to the mic and I said, is everything okay in there? They said, yeah, everything's okay. We're just wondering, where the hell have you been? <laughs> I said, is that good? They said, that's very good. That was 20 years ago. And I have literally been doing movie ads every day since that day. Opportunity had met preparedness. So I know that most, if not all of you, don't want to be voice actors, but you do want to be something. So my encouragement is to keep on going. Even when somebody tells you that you don't have the skill or the talent, you keep going. And you do the uncomfortable, because success never happens inside the comfort zone. I was at a get together with uh, some friends and there was a mathematician there. He knew something about my story. And so he came up to me and he said, let me get this straight. He said, you were a little kid and you wanted to be the voice of Disneyland and then you became the voice of Disneyland? I said, yeah. He said, do you know what the odds of that happening are? I said, no. He said, there are no odds. There is no calculation. It's impossible. So I guess what I'm here to tell you guys today, that is, if you follow your dreams, you work hard, and you're willing to take a leap of faith every once in a while, it is possible to do the impossible. And I thought that was an idea worth sharing. Thank you.